Welcome back to the Stroke Made Simple channel and today we are going to get into the second video regarding chapter 7 or cerebral aneurysms. So again all this information is uh, available in the book so before we proceed please go ahead and hit the like and subscribe button we're going to go ahead and continue with clinical concerns regarding ruptured intracranial aneurysm. So when you're presented with a ruptured brain aneurysm, there are many uh, clinical concerns to worry about. However, one of the first things you should address is hypertension. It has to be controlled to prevent re-rupture. And essentially, you want the systolic blood pressure to be less than 130. The American Heart and Stroke Associations, they recommend nicardipine, labetalol, and esmolol. But they specifically say not to use nitroprusside because it can increase intracranial pressure. And they found nicardipine to be the best agent to reduce aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage blood pressure control. So another issue that we experience with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage is mass effect in hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus or disproportional swelling of the ventricles compared to the cell side occurs in 15 to 20 percent of all aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage patients and 40 percent of these patients will become symptomatic. Hydrocephalus again as we discussed earlier usually results from obstruction of cerebral spinal fluid through the ventricular system by subarachnoid hemorrhage. So increasing hydrocephalus is associated with poor clinical grades, increasing increased concentration of subarachnoid hemorrhage on the non-contrast brain CT and increased age. Symptomatic hydrocephalus requires an external ventricular drain or an EVD to go into the ventricular system and relieve this pressure. Now, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage seizure prophylaxis with anti-epileptic drugs has been controversial and the long-term risk should only be reserved in patients with high risk, that is people that have patients that have intraparenchymal hemorrhages, cerebral infarcts, and hydrocephalus, noting that prolonged phenytoin prophylaxis is associated with the worst outcome. Aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage can also cause cardiac changes. Increased central sympathetic activity can induce myocardial damage known as neurogenic stun myocardium, which may be caused by free radicals or transient calcium overload. Now, neurogenic stun myocardium has a specific EKG pattern. That is, there is a prolonged QT interval and a massive T wave ins inversion. So this results in a decreased response of heart contractile filaments to calcium. This causes those EKG changes we discussed, elevation in cardiac enzymes, and left ventricular dysfunction. Now, neurogenic stun myocardium is not the same thing as coronary artery disease because neurogenic stun myocardium is a reversible form of cardiac failure. Cardiac output goes down and restrictions on hyperdynamic and hypervolemic therapy occur because the heart is just not functioning properly because of reduced cardiac output. This can increase delayed cerebral vasospasm. In these patients, endovascular therapy is recommended. Supportive manager, sorry, management is largely supportive, but you can use inotropes, and in severe cases, you could use intraortic balloon pumps. So what is an intraortic balloon pump? It's a balloon pump that goes into the aorta and it's inflated during diastole. And when it's inflated, it increases diastatic augmentation or increases coronary perfusion. Another thing that we encounter a lot in aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage caused by ruptured brain aneurysms is diabetes insipidus. This occurs in approximately 15% of all aneurysmal subarachnoid cases and can be associated with the worst prognosis and increased mortality. In fact, as we'll soon see, all of these abnormalities in salt and water balance and aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage is associated with worse prognosis and increased mortality, including the syndrome of inappropriate 
ADH um, secretion, as well as triple salt wasting, and we'll talk about those in one moment. So what's going on with diabetes insipidus? Well, what's going on here is the pituitary gland is making insufficient antidiuretic hormone. This causes the kidneys to make a lot of urine. So you're just peeing out all this fluid. To understand this easier, just remember diabetes insipidus means dry inside. The exact opposite of this is SIADH or the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. And this is associated with increased ADH. Again, DI is insufficient ADH. SIADH is too much ADH. And we'll talk about that in a second. But again, going back to DI, essentially the pituitary gland is making insufficient amounts of antidiuretic hormone, causing the kidneys to excrete a lot of urine. <clears throat> By the way, notice uh, in this situation, because we're decreasing the amount of fluid inside the body, the sodium osmolality is actually increasing. That's gonna be the exact opposite in SIADH, and we'll talk about that in a brief moment. So diabetes insipidus and resultant hypovolemia volemia can exacerbate, exacerbate vasospasm and worsen subarachnoid hemorrhage patient outcome is essential to ensure adequate fluid replacement to maintain blood volume and therefore blood pressure. Remember, diabetes insipidus basically means dry inside, okay? They're peeing out too much fluid, they're dry inside, and their sodium is typically elevated. The diagnosis of diabetes insipidus is determined by plasma sodium greater than 145 millimoles per liter and the presence of dilute urine osmolality less than 300 milliosmoles per kilogram and polyuria or greater than 300 milliliters per hour for two consecutive hours or greater than three liters a day. Hyponatremia, sodium levels less than 135 milliquilins per liter is the most common electrolyte imbalance encountered in aneurysmal subarachnoid patients occurring 30 to 56% of the time. Hyponatremia is associated with an increase, hyponatremia will increase the chances of, sorry, hyponatremia is found more often in patients with hydrocephalus and in higher grade hunt hest patients and is an independent risk factor for poor outcome. In fact, hyponatremic aneurysmal subarachnoid patients are 15 times more likely to have a poor income outcome. 15 times more likely to have a poor outcome just from having hyponatremia. So it's very important that we manage this disorder appropriately. Now the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, SIADH, or cerebral salt wasting, CSW, is talked about all the time when we talk about uh, hyponatremia and aneurysmal subarachnoid patients. Hyponatremia in aneurysmal subarachnoid patients results in a prolonged hospital course. It increases morbidity and it increases the chances of vasospasm. So what is SIADH? SIADH, as we said earlier, it's almost the opposite of diabetes insipidus. The syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone it is caused by elevated levels of antidiuretic hormone, which causes water resorption in the kidneys, specifically the distal convoluted tubules in the kidneys, which results in fluid retention and a dilutional hyponatremia, okay? So basically we're adding more fluid into the system and diluting sodium in the body. Think of SI as soaked inside because we're resorbing, we're increasing the concentrations of water in the body. So it's really simple. If you look here on the left, if you have more water versus less water, you're going to have a dilutional effect of whatever particles are in it. So again, when we think of SIADH, think of SI soaked inside too much water, reducing sodium osmolality. So essentially these people are hyponatremic because they have they're retaining too much water. 
Now, cerebral salt wasting is characterized by normal antidiuretic hormone levels, but this results from urinary sodium excretion causing hyponatremia. So this should really be called renal salt wasting syndrome, but it's called cerebral salt wasting syndrome. And essentially we're excreting too much urinary sodium and that's what causes the hyponatremia. Thus, SIADH patients tend to be euvolemic or hypervolemic, while CSW patients are more likely to be hypovolemic. Now, an easy way to remember this is SIADH has more letters. Think of hypervolemic. CSW is less letters. Think of hypovolemic. Another way to remember this is remember SIADH, SI soaked inside, okay? The retaining water, hypervolemic. Now, you're going to run into individuals when they're managing aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage who will engage in this epic battle, whether or not we're dealing with SIADH or CSW, which one is causing the patient's hyponatremia? Well, I'll tell you, in relation to aneurysmal subarachnoid patients, CSW is really a zebra diagnosis. It's overcalled, it's overthought, and overworried about. In fact, studies have demonstrated in aneurysmal subarachnoid patients, 90 over 90% of the time, hyponatremia is called by is caused by SIADH. Heck, it's even in the name. Look at this. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, it has the same letters as SIADH, it contains the same exact letters. So remember, when you're dealing with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, call hyponatremia in that group of patients, call it SIDH and you'll be, you'll be right over 95% of the time. Now, you will get people that'll still contend that it's not SIDH and they're dealing with CSW. And I think essentially to those people, you have to just slap the CSW out of them. So hypovolemia cerebral salt wasting versus hypervolemia, remember SIADH soaked inside, are opposing, have opposing therapeutic goals. For SIADH, essentially, you would water restrict these patients and water overloaded SIADH patients, whereas in CSW, you would provide salt and water to volume depleted CSW patients. However, we don't do that. We don't volume restrict SIADH patients. Again, we don't volume or fluid restrict SIADH patients, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, because if we did, there's an increase of cerebral edema, vasospasm, and subsequent cerebral infarction. For these reasons, volume infusion of hypertonic saline is always favored in clinical practice. Fluid restriction in hyponatremic patients and aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage hyponatremic patients is related to an increased incidence of delayed cerebral ischemia. So we don't want to encourage fluid restriction. Fluid restriction in aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage patients can also increase the risk of cerebral vasospasm. SIDH is treated by fluid restricting less than 5 milliliters per day, but many aneurysmal subarachnoid patients, sorry, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage patients receive enteral two feeds, which is one to two liters of fluid daily. So again, this really makes no sense. Some insist they can still differentiate SIDH from CSW. There is a way you could do that with a fractional excretion of urate, but again, when you're dealing with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage patients with hyponatremia, it's almost always SIADH. Here's the fractional excretion of urate formula if you'd like to know it, but again, think SIADH. Essentially, whether you're dealing with SIADH or CSW, both of these, because we're not going to fluid restrict SIADH patients, aneurysmal subarachnoid subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, both of these conditions, SIADH and CSW, are going to be treated with hypertonic saline. Remember, SIADH associated with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage patients mandate treatment with hypertonic saline. If you restrict, you could exasperate vasospasm. 
Essentially, the treatment of SIADH and CSW is the same. We're just giving them salt. Again, if you look at aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage and SIADH, the, the same letters are in both terms. So essentially, just remember, over 95% of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage hyponatremia is caused by SA, sorry, SIADH. Thus, the use of hypertonic signaling can be used to treat both SIADH and CSW. However, be cognizant of too rapid of correction of hyponatremia. It can result in something called osmotic demyelinization, and we'll talk about that in one second. Alternatively, insufficient or delayed correction of hyponatremia can result in cerebral edema, phasospasm, seizures, or even death. Now, when we talk about the treatment of hyponatremia in aneurysmal subarachnoid patients, we're basically re maintaining a euvolemic or hypovolemic state. Typically, we infuse hypertonic saline 3% at 30, 30 cc's an hour with caution, checking serum sodium every four to six hours. Another simple rule of thumb is when you're you could, if you're using 3% normal saline, if you use the patient's body mass in kilograms, so for example, say there's 70 kilograms, and you keep that the rate of infusion per hour, so this would be 70 cc's of 3% normal saline per hour, you typically increase uh, the sodium concentration by one millimole per liter. So when you are doing hypertonic saline, make sure you do not overcorrect or increase this by six to eight milliequivalents per liter per day. Rapid overcorrection can result in a condition caused, called osmotic myelinolysis. Now, this was in the past called central pontine myelinolysis because this was seen in alcoholics and this was affecting typically the pons. And this is caused by, this is an acute non-inflammatory demyelinating disease that is caused by the destruction of myelin sheaths with sparing of the axons and neurons. We don't fully understand why specific brain territories are involved, but this no longer only exclusively involves the pons. There are other structures that can be involved here. We see the basal ganglia, the uh, lateral aspects of both thalami here. Here we see the pons. But again, for this reason, we've switched the term from cent central pontine myelinolysis to osmotic myelinolysis. So we discussed a lot of clinical concerns uh, dealing with ruptured aneurysms, and those concerns involved high blood pressure. Remember, we want to maintain the systolic blood pressure less than 130. We discussed that nicardipine is the superior agent to do this. We discussed hyponatremia in subarachnoid, sorry, in aneurysmal subarachnoid patients. Remember, in almost all cases, it's SIADH is the cause of hyponatremia. But we don't fluid restrict these patients. We treat them with hypertonic saline. Okay, when we treat them with hypertonic saline, remember CSW, cerebral salt wasting patients, are treated the same way. So really, we're treating them the same way. So the diagnosis doesn't really even matter. But again, in over 95% of the time, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage is caused by SIADH. Remember when you correct, don't correct too fast, meaning don't do more than six to eight units per day of sodium correction. If you do, you could run the risk of having osmotic myelolysis, which we just discussed. Okay, so cerebral vasospasm is a major source of morbidity and mortality in aneurysmal subarachnoid patients. Blood products from the aneurysm induce an inflammatory reaction, which can result in cerebral vasospasm. However, this is a delayed response, which typically occurs four to 21 days after the aneurysm rupture. The risk of cerebral vasospasm increases with the amount of subarachnoid hemorrhage, and we discussed this Fisher scale earlier. So remember, grade one is no subarachnoid hemorrhage. Grade two is diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage less than one millimeter thick. Grade three is diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage greater than one millimeter thick. And grade four is 
subarachnoid hemorrhage, doesn't matter how thick it is, with intracranial hemorrhage or intraventricular hemorrhage. Okay, so grade four, again, is diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage with intracerebral hemorrhage, sorry, and intraventricular hemorrhage. Cerebral vasospasm can be diagnosed with CTA, transcranial Doppler studies, or cerebral angiography. Cerebral angiography remains the gold standard. Remember, it's the gold standard for detection of aneurysms, detection of vasospasm, everything. However, CTA also has a high sensitivity for its detection. Transcranial Dopplers are operator dependent, but typically only severe cerebral vasospasm can be reliably determined by transcranial Dopplers. So here's an angiogram, and look, we're going to review some anatomy. Here's the distal carotid artery. Here's the ophthalmic artery, so now everything distal to this is the supraclinoid segment, which has some vasospasm. Medial to the carotid terminus is the anterior artery. The first segment's the A1. We see there's some vasospasm here. Lateral, the first segment is the M1. There's some vasospasm of the right M1 here. There's a superior and inferior division. This is the M2 segment. You can see that there's some proximal M2 segment vasospasm of the superior division of the right MCA. So again, you could apply this anatomy all the time. Nemotapine is the only FDA-approved drug for the treatment of cerebral vasospasm. Nemotapine used 60 milligrams every four hours for 21 days is associated with a 34% reduction in cerebral infarction and a 40% reduction in poor clinical outcome. Triple H therapy, hypertension, hypervolemia, and a hemodilution. This was all the rage. But now we're realizing there's no significant difference in the rate of cerebral vasospasm or clinical outcomes using triple H versus euvolemic therapy. If you're going to treat cerebral vasospasm, the way to treat it medically is with hypertension. Hypertension is more effective at increasing cerebral blood flow than either hemodilution or hypervolemia in these patients with vasospasm. The American Heart Association guidelines recommends the maintenance of a euvolemic state for vasospasm prevention and induced hypertension only for active cerebral vasospasm patients. Hypovolemia without radiographic evidence of vasospasm is also discouraged. So we talked a lot, we talked about many clinical concerns related to ruptured brain aneurysms, which can be remembered by the mnemonic shaves. S is for seizures, or as for seizure, again, the prolonged use of phenytoin, phenytoin is discouraged. H is for hydrocephalus and mass effect. A is for a stunned myocardium. V is for vasospasm. Remember, this occurs four to 21 days after aneurysmal rupture. We use nemotapine for this. E is for elevated blood pressure. Again, nicaropine is the best agent for this. And S is for SIADH, which is the most common cause of hyponatremia in, sub in aneurysmal subarachnoid patients over 95% of the time versus CSW. But it really doesn't matter because we're treating both of these patients the same with hypertonic saline. We are not fluid restricted. We are not going to fluid restrict fluid overloaded SIADH patients. Again, you're going to hear people talk about CSW, to slap the CSW out of them. If it's aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage over 95% of the time, it's SIADH. Again, all of this stuff is covered in the book. If you enjoyed this lecture, please hit the like and subscribe button. And again, thank you very much for your time.